Welcome to this afternoon session. Uh, so we're gonna have 12 contributed talks, six now, six later. Uh, each of you has 15 minutes. Sorry for the short time. Um, I decided to be fair that the iPhone is gonna keep track of time for me. And uh, it's gonna do this sound. Oh, maybe it's not. <laughs> maybe I should show something stronger. Uh, I don't know what. Some sound that I will choose soon. Some sound uh, after 30 minutes, so that at least you know that you have only two minutes left to kind of conclude the talk. Uh, so we can start with Dennis and uh, please. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to be here and talk today about uh, this free boundary problem related to thermal insulation. Uh, so this is going to be joint work with, uh, with Luis Caffarelli. Um, and let me begin by giving you a quick reminder about, uh, about the alt caffarelli problem, sort of in its original uh, variational formulation. So the setup of it is you're given a domain omega. So this is something fixed. Think of it as a smooth bounded domain, say. And you're going to solve for um, the set A, which encloses omega. And the way you do it is, well, so the domain omega is being held at a constant temperature one, and the rest of the world is at a constant temperature zero. And A is some kind of insulator you're putting around omega, uh, and what you're trying to do is to um, minimize the, uh, the rate, of, well, the, the heat flux passing through the boundary of omega, the sort of rate at which it's losing energy. Um, and this heat flux is uh, given by the normal derivative so new here is the outer unit normal um, uh, of the harmonic function that you get by solving, uh, uh, well, Laplace equation with these boundary conditions. Uh, and so you're going to minimize the heat flux, but you're also paying some fixed amount per unit volume for, uh, for the insulation material, which is this, this price C bar. And by integrating my parts, you can instead minimize uh, the Dirichlet energy instead. And here you can minimize overall H1 functions uh, which are one over here and zero outside of omega, uh, sorry, outside of A um, instead. Okay, so the problem that we were looking at comes from the following uh, sort, of, uh, sort of setup. So similar problem, you're uh, given omega and you're going to try to find A, which is sort of the best insulator, but this time somebody then comes around um, and pays on a very thin layer of a much better insulator over uh, your original domain A. So this is, uh, this is a, a, so this, this gamma epsilon is an epsilon neighborhood and it has um, uh, a much, uh, much lower heat conductivity. Um, and, okay, so uh, you, can, you can write down the, the, the equation for the uh, heat distribution here is going to solve a transmission problem. Um, and you're minimizing the same quantity. Except for, okay, so you integrated it by parts and now you have two different energy densities in the two different parts of the, uh, the domain. And sort of we're interested in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Um, and sort of heuristically, um, okay, I'm not gonna go through the, uh, the full explanation, but uh, so uh, U is well approximated by a line, uh, like little line segments near, uh, so the, the, the gradient is almost constant uh, heuristically. Uh, on, on this, this epsilon neighborhood. And so if you perform the computation, uh, what do you see in the limit or what do you expect in the limit um, is this functional. Um, so here you're minimizing, uh, well, again, so you, you, you minimize it over uh, the harmonic function, which is one on the interior here. And over here it's going to solve, uh, instead of the Dirichlet condition we had before, it's going to solve a Robin condition. So, uh, so this, um, and uh, so, so now you're minimizing this functional, uh, which corresponds to the, the same thing as, as previously. And you can minimize it instead, again, instead of over harmonic functions solving this boundary value problem over all H1 functions, which are one uh, uh, on omega, and you're automatically going to recover the harmonic function if you minimize over U as well. Okay, so this is, this is really the problem we're interested in, and uh, to say just a couple of words why uh, we're interested in it from a mathematical point of view. Well, this is a free boundary problem, right? This A, boundary of A is like a free boundary here. 
Uh, but instead of having the Dirichlet condition on the free boundary, which is what uh, sort of the obstacle problem, the 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 alt Caffarelli problem, uh, all have on the free boundary, it has instead this Robin condition, which is sort of like a perturbed Neumann condition. So a lot of the methods which are uh, have been developed for uh, free boundary problems with the Dirichlet condition don't uh, really carry over here. Like we don't know as much about the fine structures of harmonic functions with this boundary data. Uh, we don't have the same monotonicity formulas available uh, and so forth. Okay, so our goals are, okay, prove that minimizers exist. Um, so this is going to involve some kind of relaxation of the problem to some, some, some weak formulation. And then uh, we want to say that, well, actually, these minimizers make sense in the, in the framework I've written over here, that they actually, uh, uh, so that's going to require some kind of measure theoretic estimates on, uh, on the minimizers. Then sort of partial regularity. You know, at most points, the free boundary is a nice graph, for example. Um, and then finally, uh, sort of fine properties uh, uh, of the free boundary, like the structure of the singular set. Or, so you, it's possible for this problem that the boundary of A coincides with the boundary of omega and portions, uh, and how, how they separate from each other would be a, in that category. So I'm going to say mostly something about one, and I'll mention results about two and three, and I won't say anything at all about four. Um, so for one, our idea is to use just direct methods. So we're going to uh, take a minimizing sequence, show that it's compact uh, in some appropriate sense, and that the functional is lower semi-continuous with respect to that topology. Um, our idea for this is, is very simple. So we look at this functional, right? And there's one term which looks like very helpful uh, when it comes to showing that the sequence of sets is compact. And that's the term that uh, includes an integral over the boundary of that set. So you see, for instance, if we knew a priori that these minimizers, the minimal harmonic functions were bounded from below, uh, this term would control the perimeter of A. And then hopefully by controlling the perimeter of A, that will produce compactness and we can pass to the subsequence and, uh, and conclude. Um, so it's not true that if I just take random uh, minimizing sequences that the U is going to be bounded from below. Uh, so here's an example of what can happen. Um, you see, if I start with something which looks reasonable, like this A, and I add on this sort of reservoir separated by a very, very thin neck, then U over here is going to be very close to zero, arbitrarily close to zero in the limit that as the neck gets thinner and thinner. Um, at the same time, you don't really expect this kind of thing to be close to being minimal, because you could sort of just cut along this neck, and that, well, that gets rid of a lot in this, this volume penalization term. So uh, you don't expect these to be, to be really minimizers. Um, so based on this observation, we prove you should think of this as an a priori estimate. So uh, if you have a smooth minimizer, uh, then there is a constant which depends only on the original domain in some, some weak way, like its size. I mean, uh, this isn't really significant. Uh, such that U is strictly larger than this positive number. Um, so, uh, right, so the fact that it's smooth here, uh, the, the fact that it's smooth uh, and the fact that it's a minimizer do, means you still have some work to do in order to actually use this in an appropriate way in the minimizing sequence. Um, but sort of this is the estimate uh, which underlies all of the uh, existence theory we do. Um, I won't say anything about the proof other than it involves cutting along level sets of U and using those as competitors. Um, okay, so to show other difficulties you, uh, you encounter when you try to show existence, well, let me give you a quick example. So if you start out with a ball as omega, it's uh, possible to show that your minimizer is also a ball. And once you know that, you can compute exactly which ball it is, uh, you know, what the radius of this ball is. And so for some parameters, the parameter being the size of the original ball, uh, you get non-trivial minimizers, meaning that A is not equal to omega. Um, and you get different values of U along the boundary of A uh, for different radii of uh, the starting ball. So if I take two of those with two different values of U on the, uh, on the edges here, and I start with them very far apart, then my minimizer for the union of those two balls is going to be the union of the two minimizers for the individual balls. 
Uh, but as I move them closer and closer together, it's not altogether clear what happens because you can have sort of two possibilities. You know, okay, at some point something else has to happen. They will either um, sort of uh, uh, become connected like this, uh, or they become disconnected, and there's going to be a part of the boundary of A which sees two different components of A on either side uh, with two different asymptotic values of U on the two uh, edges. And I, okay, so I don't know which one of these is the global minimizer, but this one is sort of a local minimizer. Um, that's, that's not that hard to see. Uh, so at least if you only allow small perturbations, this is, uh, a, seems to be a configuration that actually happens. Um, and we don't have any way of ruling this out. So you see, if you try to minimize over sets of finite perimeter, A for example, you get into trouble because sets of finite perimeter don't really lend themselves to this. Uh, this is not really counted as part of the perimeter of sets of finite perimeter. Uh, so instead we uh, reformulate the problem in terms of uh, SBV functions. So these are special functions of bounded variation. What that means is you have a BV function whose derivative is either absolutely continuous or it has a uh, pure jump part and it has none of the cantor part that BV functions are also allowed to have. Uh, and sort of the, this, these were studied in the, in the 90s by Ambrosio uh, and, and others for uh, in, in relation to the Mumford-Shaw problem. Uh, and so they proved uh, sort of uh, compactness and lower semi-continuity results for SBE functions. So our, um, uh, our problem makes sense when you phrase it in terms of SBV by uh, writing down the characteristic function of A. Um, and uh, so, right, if I go back over here, you set u to be zero outside of the configuration I've drawn in red. Uh, so you see the jumps in u uh, correspond to, well, either parts of the boundary of A where I was, that's, you know, the normal free boundary, and also you get a contribution from places where u is making a jump and I have this behavior where I have two different connected components of A uh, near a piece of the boundary of A. Uh, so if you write it down in this way, this is the, uh, upper and lower limits from the possible sides near a jump point. Uh, this will correctly count the, uh, the contribution from the, the boundary term. Um, and so you can minimize over this, and the theorem is, well, together with the a priori estimate, uh, there exists a minimizer. Okay. Uh, so this is an SBV minimizer, so it's somehow been relaxed to something, something weaker. In order to say that it actually behaves the way you would expect, you want to say that, uh, for instance, um, you have a uniform density estimate on the singular set of this, this minimizer, on the jump set of this SBV function. Uh, and in fact, that's true. So the upper bound on the perimeter is, is trivial. You sort of subtract balls and uh, use them as competitors, and it's really easy to see. The lower bound um, is not obvious, but it, it follows uh, sort of the Mumford-Shaw theory. We can, we can use the proof that um, Di Giorgi, Carriero, and Liacci uh, came up with in, in uh, this, this is I think 95 or so um, for, for the Mumford-Shaw problem. Uh, and uh, that carries over without many changes to, to our case. Okay, and then the final thing I would like to say something about is uh, we can also have, uh, prove a flat implies smooth result. So um, what this says is if you look at a point in uh, the boundary of A and you are in a situation where uh, it's trapped between two hyperplanes separated by a distance delta r uh, on, a, on a ball of radius r, sort of this flat picture, uh, then in fact uh, on a smaller ball uh, is given by, so the, uh, the boundary of A is given by uh, two graphs, uh, a union of two graphs, one of which is above the other. Um, so I should say, so the reason you have two graphs is because of the previous example I gave, uh, right? I can have parts of the boundary of A touching and then they will, uh, uh, they, they will separate in a way that I can't really, uh, really control. Um, okay, so that's, that's, that's all I really wanted to say. Um, and so there are a lot of still interesting questions about this remaining. Uh, and so thank you for, for your attention.